Hey guys, Mr. Backer here. This is part one of lesson 12.2. We've got three objectives for this video. We're going to use dividing out to evaluate limits. We're going to use rationalizing to evaluate limits. And we're going to approximate limits graphically and numerically. One technique we've talked about as far as solving limits is direct substitution. So if we were looking at this limit of x squared plus x minus 6 over x plus 3 as x approaches negative 3, if we tried to do direct substitution there, we'd get negative 3 squared plus negative 3 minus 6 all over negative 3 plus 3. And if we look at simplifying this down, negative 3 squared is 9, minus 3 is 6, minus 6, we get 0 on top. And if we look at the denominator, we also get 0. Having this 0 over 0 fraction is something called indeterminate form. And basically, when we have this indeterminate form, we can't figure out what the limit is at a specific x value. Now, indeterminate form does not mean that the limit doesn't exist. We can still have a limit, even if we do get this indeterminate form. If we look at the table down below, as we approach negative 3 from the left-hand side, and as we approach negative 3 from the right-hand side, it looks like we're getting really, really close to negative 5. But we're not seeing that from this indeterminate form fraction. So one technique that we can use is called dividing out. And dividing out involves doing a little bit of factoring. So if we look at the stuff on top, we can factor that out. We can factor that into x minus 2 and x plus 3. Then on bottom, we've still got that x plus 3. Now, we've got this x plus 3 on top and bottom, so we can cancel that out. So now we've got this limit of x minus 2 as x approaches negative 3. And now if we use our direct substitution, just replace the x with a negative 3, we get negative 3 minus 2, which is that negative 5, which we saw from our table. Next example, we've got this limit as x approaches 1. First thing I want to check is just to make sure that direct substitution isn't going to work. So I'm going to plug in that 1 for all of these different x values. And if we look on top, 1 minus 1 is 0. On bottom, all these 1s are going to cancel out, so we get 0. So yes, we do have this indeterminate form. So we're going to go through and do our dividing out. So I'm looking at this denominator, looking to see if we can do any factoring. And we're going to have to do a little factoring by grouping on this one. So I'm going to group these first two terms together, and we can factor out an x squared. Then we're left over with x minus 1. If we look at grouping up these second things, I would just take a 1 out of there, so then it stays x minus 1. And then if we look at a GCF of x minus 1, pull that out front, x minus 1, times the leftovers, x squared plus 1. That's going to be our new denominator. So now we've got x minus 1 over this factored out version, x minus 1 times x squared plus 1. Now if we do our dividing out, these x minus 1s are going to cancel out. So now we've got the limit of 1 over x squared plus 1 as x is approaching 1. And using our direct substitution, replacing the x with a 1, we get 1 over 1 squared plus 1. So we get 1 half as the limit. Taking a look at our next example, we've got the limit of the square root of x plus 1 minus 1 over x as x approaches 0. So if we try to use direct substitution and plug in 0 here, we get square root of 0 plus 1 minus 1 all over 0. So we end up with that indeterminate form 0 over 0 again. So what we're going to do, we're going to use a technique called rationalizing. And what that involves doing is using a conjugate. So if we're taking a look at this numerator, its conjugate would be the square root of x plus 1. And then we'll throw an extra plus 1 on the end. Because the conjugate, we change the sign on what's going on here. We had a minus 1, so we change that to a plus 1. And what we're going to do is multiply by that conjugate on top and on bottom. So we're going to have to do a little bit of foiling on top. So we're going to take this square root times our other square root. Well, when we take a square root times itself, all we have left over is the stuff underneath the radical. So we have the x plus 1 left over. Then if we take our 1 times the square root, we get plus this square root of x plus 1. Then if we take this negative 1 times the square root, we get a minus square root of x plus 1. And then negative 1 times 1 is negative 1. And then on the bottom, I'm not actually going to distribute this x. I'm just going to leave it as x times this square root of x plus 1 plus 1. Now on top, we should notice that these middle two terms are going to cancel each other out since they have opposite signs. And we can also cancel out this plus 1 and this minus 1. So all we've got left over on the top is an x. And then on bottom, we've got x times this square root of x plus 1 
plus one. Then I think we can see these x's are gonna cancel each other out. So now we've got one over the square root of x plus one plus one. And now we're gonna do the limit of this as x approaches zero. We can now use our direct substitution. So plugging in zero for that x, we get one over the square root of zero plus one plus one. Well, zero plus one is one, and the square root of one is one. So on top, we've still got one. On bottom, we get two. So we've got a half as this limit. Next thing we're gonna look at doing is using our calculator to approximate a limit using the table feature. So we've got the limit of one plus x raised to the power of one over x, and we're gonna look at this as x approaches zero. So I've already got my function typed into the y equals screen, so just make sure yours matches up with mine. And then I'm going to go second table, so we can look at the table of values. Now, if we look at this as our x value is approaching zero, well, we get an error at zero. So I'm gonna look at the two values that are directly before and after that zero. So at negative 0.001 and at positive 0.001. So we've got this 2.7196 and 2.7169. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna average those things out. So 2.7196 plus 2.7169. And we're gonna divide that by two to get an average. And when we do that, we should get 2.71825. So we can approximate the limit of this function to be that number. Last thing we're going to do is check out a limit graphically. So we've got the limit of sine of x over x as x is approaching zero. So I've already got this function typed into my calculator. So if we hit our graph button, we end up with a picture that looks something like this. If you take a look at my window, my x minimum is negative four and my x maximum is positive four. My y max and mins are at two and negative two. Now what I wanna to do to get a better picture of this graph and what's happening as x approaches zero is I wanna zoom in on that zero x value. So we're gonna zoom in and I'm gonna arrow up so we're right at the top of that graph. And then we'll hit enter so it'll zoom in on that spot. Now I'm gonna use my trace button to move left and right. So as we're moving in from the left hand side, we can see that our Y value is getting really, really close to one. But once we hit zero, there isn't a Y value there. It's undefined because we can't have zero on the bottom of this fraction. If we arrow a little bit past it and move in from the right hand side, we can again see that we're getting really, really close to one. So even though this function doesn't exist at X equals zero, we can still figure out that its limit is approximately one. That's going to be it for this video. Please remember to fill out the Google form linked in the description down below. And thanks for watching.